Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Iracana, Alberta Mayor Jim Bryson. Iracana is well known for its tranquil small town environment of over 1,200 residents. Located in the Calgary metropolitan region of Alberta, the town's name is an abbreviation for irrigation canals, which are found in the community. Iracana is home to a number of historical buildings, such as the Pioneer Acres of Alberta Museum and the Grain Academy, as well as numerous, numerous colorful murals that display the works of local artists across the community. There are plenty of campgrounds, as well as numerous parks and playgrounds, soccer fields and curling rinks, which provide abundance of recreational opportunities for residents and visitors alike. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Iracana Mayor Jim Bryson. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs. And they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Mayor Bryson, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by asking a simple question, but an all-important one for the show, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Jim? Uh, well... When I retired, uh, I actually got some time to spend in town because I was always on the road. I was only home on weekends. And I, I got to noticing a few things that kind of bothered me a little bit. Um, a lot of the, well, the CAO at the time was only part-time. He'd, he'd only show up maybe one evening and on a Saturday. Um, and a lot of the residents as well were blaming the union for a lot of the issues that were happening in town. And when I looked into it, it really wasn't the case. So uh, being a union member, I thought I could help resolve some of the issues, which is has happened. And then there was uh, also there seemed to be a lack of direction in town. So... Uh, after talking to some of the longtime residents and voicing my concerns, they asked me to run. So I ran, and uh, I guess the rest is history. The rest is history, but let's talk about that history for a few seconds, if you don't mind. So from yeah. what I can gather, the first time you put your name forward for municipal elections is in 2017, correct? Correct. Yeah. Had you considered it beforehand, had you considered ever getting into the political arena prior to 2017 or was 2017 and let's just say 2016, because you don't just decide the day before the election that you're going to put your name on the ballot. There are some, <laughs> but they're, they're, you, I, you, you seem like someone who does not do that. So prior to 2017, had you considered getting into a life of politics or was that so outside the realm of what your reality wanted to be? Absolutely never considered it at all. It was just um, a few good friends from town asked me, and I thought, well, they obviously think I have something to contribute, so I'll give it a shot. So you've now served almost a, year, a term and a half. We're almost at the midway, or we're just past the midway point of your second term here. You get elected Correct. as a councillor. Uh, the mayor resigns in 2022. I'm assuming you then become mayor right after that. So a guy who doesn't have any interest in politics, who didn't consider a life in politics, in five short years, you become mayor of your community. How does it feel to be mayor now? Sometimes it's kind of good. Sometimes it's humbling. And sometimes it's just a pain. 
I like an honest municipal leader. It's very refreshing, Jim. Um, you as mayor and as counselor when you were there, and I'm going to assume here, and I, you, you know you should never assume because you know what the old saying is, but I'm yeah. going to assume <laughs> for a second that you've had to make some very tough choices in your time in office. And you know you have probably had to upset a few of your residents. For a community of just over 1,200 people, how do you make those tough decisions for the best interest of your community? You have to look at the community as a whole. You have to make a decision that you feel is going to benefit the majority of the citizens. You can't look at well, I'm going to offend so-and-so, well, that's too bad because our decisions um, have to be for the what's best for the town as a whole, not as individuals. Is it hard? It can be. How do you... It can how be do you... very hard. Do you get a sense, because while you were elected to make those tough decisions, I'm assuming you don't make those tough decisions by yourself. You're asking people, you're asking the people who asked you to run what their opinions on things are. Do, do you get a sense that people are willing to give you their feedback, their honest, unfiltered feedback on the decisions that you have to make? Some people do, and there's a, a small contingent, and I'm I'm sure it's in every town and village that no matter what decision you make, it's the wrong one. Um, <laughs> we've had a couple of people in town that, uh, well, I call them keyboard cowards because they get on social media and they they do all kinds of uh, uneducated things. They talk about policies or happenings without knowing all the data that's involved in in what they're talking about. And they, they try and stir people up. But, uh, you know, you got to make a decision for the town, you make it. Keep on going. Do you get a sense that people understand what's going on in the community? Because when I speak to municipal leaders, I hear the sense that there is an apathy when it comes to municipal politics and municipal governance. There's a sense that from residents, as long as my water's turned on when I go and have a shower in the morning or what my garbage is picked up when I put my garbage can at, at the end of the driveway, I really am okay with what's going on with council as long as you keep my taxes low as well. In your community, do you get a sense that people are willing to chat with you about the, the issues that are going on or is it there is there an apathy in your community? Um. What you say about it, as long as the services are there, they're they're quite happy. They do get a little upset when the taxes have to go up, um, especially now with the everybody complaining about the cost of electricity, the cost of gas. Um, but the town has to pay that as well. So, and the only real source of revenue we have is property taxes. So. Yes, there's apathy to a certain point, but then uh, it's only the ones who want to stir crap up or who are unhappy that say something. All the people that are content with the town and understand that these decisions have to be made, they're the ones that don't don't say anything. So it, a lot of the times it looks like the residents, shall we say, of the town are really upset. It's only a very small percentage. Do you do you still take pride? I don't want to. I don't want to ask it that way. I'm going to rephrase this question. While they may be upset, how important is it for you, as mayor, as the elected official in the community, to listen to their opinions as well? Because. You can't just brush them off and say your your opinion doesn't matter or your voice doesn't matter because it doesn't align to what I'm voting on. They're there and they know you, so there has to be a sense that you have to listen to them as well, right? You have to listen to them, absolutely. But you have to try and explain the reason you're making the decisions you are and what... Uh, 
we as council hope the outcome of those decisions are, are going to be so that it's for the better of the town. As long as you, you try and tell the truth as to what you're doing, um, it is what it is. It, it, you just brought up a good segment. And I have to ask this question because you said the word that I am passionate about on this show, and that is truth. Is it more important to tell the truth, even though you know you're going to upset someone, than just tell them something that may just brush them off for a few hours? How important is it for a local municipal leader like yourself to tell people the honest, unfiltered truth, even if it means that you're going to upset that person? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You have to tell the truth, because if you don't do that down the road, you're going to be in more trouble and you're <laughs> going to upset more people. That's true. Um, there's no point in telling people what they want to hear. You need to tell them what they need to hear. I like that sentiment. I want to turn to the community as a whole, if you don't mind, for a few minutes. And I want to talk about the challenges that municipalities are facing right now. Before I do that, I'm going to preface this as I always do on this show by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is just his unfiltered opinion on this show. So in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest challenge or challenges facing your community today? Biggest challenges. That would be uh, being in Alberta. Uh, our, um, I'm not going to say the word grants. Our allotment of money from the province is going down. Um, so. Did did you Financial not get a good LGF? Did you not get a good LGFF funding allocate? Uh, allocate well, no, our LGFF, our LGFF is on par with the rest of the municipalities. Um, however, uh, the total pool of LGFF money from the province is down from what it was years ago, uh, considerably. Therefore, our portions are are reduced. And um, when you start, we're a town that's over 100 years old. We have infrastructure that needs updating to care for. So as you said, when the people wake up in the morning, they have water, they have sewer, uh, their garbage does pick up. So in order to update that infrastructure, it costs money. Now, are we going to start raising taxes? And with this housing uh, shortage. They want more housing. Well, more housing means more infrastructure, which is more money. So financial support from the province is, is an issue. So I want to talk about infrastructure for a second, because you, 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 you talk about something that I hear a lot from a lot of smaller municipalities across not only Alberta, but across Canada. You're right. Things are getting tougher right now, and municipalities are playing a big role in trying to address the housing crisis and house addressing housing files. But you can't build houses without the infrastructure. In place. So I can't, exactly. can't, can't, can't believe I have to say that in 2024, but here we are in 2024 needing to say that. The province, the federal government is looking at municipalities right now and saying, you need to build more faster, quicker. You can't do that because you know that that means that it's going to go on the backs of the people that are currently in your community. And for a community of your size, that's a big chunk of money that you have to ask people to fork over to potentially do that. How do you Correct. balance the challenges you're facing with the infrastructure, with the realities you are in? Are you telling administration to hold off on infrastructure projects because you just can't afford them right now? No. Um, Fortunately, we have a very, very good administration now. Um, he's he's uh, there in the process of doing assessments of our infrastructure, uh, which hasn't been done in years, to find out 
exactly where the problems are, where we need to spend dollars. Uh, prioritizing everything is what we're doing. So that, yeah, we've, we've got a problem here, but it's going to be okay for another five years. But this little section here needs to be done soon. And that's where we put our capital dollars for infrastructure. Going back to the original quest line of questioning about those challenging decisions you have to make, I, I, I can imagine that when you go out downtown or go to an event in your community, you're getting stopped and saying, hey, Jim, we have an issue with this pothole in front of our house and we need you to fix oh, yeah. it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> he already knows the line of the question that I'm going to ask him, but I love it already. Um, but you have to live in the the reality of there's priorities that you have to put into place of this road is worse off than this road, or this intersection is worse than this intersection. How do you, and I say you as the Royal you, as you in council, balance the needs of the community with the needs of the individual? Because when someone pays their property tax, they want to feel like that money is being spent on them as well. And that road that is not in front of their house that they don't potentially drive on every day may not seem like important to them. So how do you ensure that they feel like their property taxes are going towards not only the betterment of the community, but the betterment of their portion of the community as well? Well, uh, again, that that is... Uh how do I say this? We govern, we don't manage. That is, uh, admitted. we expect administration, if we they get a complaint about a pothole, fill the pothole. If it's with gravel or just wet patch on a temporary basis till there's a, a more permanent solution to the problem, fine. Do something right away to resolve the issue, even though it's not a permanent fix to let people know that we do care. But again, we're trying to utilize our resources as efficiently as we possibly can. And that's is that it, to me right now is very important. Is it getting harder to utilize those resources? Because I'm assuming you've just gone through your budget cycle and you have probably it's seen coming. all the, it's coming. So you're go, you're seeing the price tags that are going up. The cost yeah. of doing business in municipalities is going up, but if you increase your taxes 1%, even 2%, or heck, even a half a percent, people are struggling right now. And I, and I hate to make light of it, but you have to do a business, but you also have to live in the reality that people can't afford things as much as they used to be able to because it just costs more. How do you strike the balance of being able to advance your city, work on the projects you need to work on while not ensuring that the people are struggling even worse? That's not easy. Yeah. Uh, um, how do we do that? Well, yes, the cost of living is going up. Everybody's struggling. I myself am retired. I'm on a fixed income. Raising taxes hurts me. Uh, more so likely than somebody working or somebody with a young family. That being said, the cost of doing business is going up. And if you want those same services and dependable, uh, I'm sorry, the cost is going up. Now, recently, the assessments, um, which are taxes are based on have gone up. So our tax mill rate is likely not going to go up. I, I use the word likely, but our income is going to go up basically because the assessments went up, which means everybody's house in town is worth more money. So is it? And then, no. and then on the flip side of that as well, the province plays a role into those property taxes as well, because there's that education portion of the property taxes that some people don't really understand. So I just want to make sure that's clarified. Because yeah, that, that, that's another point. <laughs> the provincial province tells us what we're collecting for school tax. So we administratively has to collect the tax and then just pass it on to the government. So that's part of property tax that the town 
does not see one cent. Actually, it costs us to do it. But that is that is something that you're quite right. People think that's oh, my property tax. Well, that's your education tax, which has nothing to do with the town other than we're the collection agency. You talked about it. there's a few challenges, and I interrupted you because I want to talk. I wanted to talk about infrastructure, but what's the what's the second biggest challenge that is facing your community today? Well, uh, can I ask a stupid a question? question? Can I ask a stupid question and not to be <laughs> not not picking on you at all as the mayor of your community? But I've got a. Over the last few years, I've noticed that more and more smaller communities are struggling to retain their population base. And that means actually keeping the retention of residents or even attraction of residents. I know a few people who've moved to your community over the last five years. I actually know of two of them who've moved to your community. And that's why I wanted to reach out to have you on the show. Is Iricana facing that same issue right now where their attraction of or retention of residents is a priority for them not currently um oh. currently when a house goes on the market in town it usually sells within a week or two um based on what's going on like we're only 30 minutes out of calgary 30 or 40 minutes out of calgary so with the property tax problem in Calgary, the cost of buying a house in Calgary, and we're quite uh, in the range of commuting, people are looking at us and saying, hey, I'm coming. So um, we have a small developer in town. He's built uh, three houses last year. I think he's on his fourth now. And they're sold before he's finished. So, and I noticed in, in Bicycler, a town north of us here, a village nine kilometers away, their uh, real estate is moving very quickly. Like in town, there's no place here you can rent. It, it, the house across the road from me went up for sale. Within a week, it was sold, and they got a top dollar for it. And it's it's been like that for about a year now. So what do you chalk that up to? Is it just people wanting a different lifestyle than what they're getting? Or is it because Iricana offers something that they're not getting in more larger communities? Because since, and I hate to use the C word, but I'm going to use it a little bit here. Since COVID, I find that more and more people are returning back, sort of reversing their mindset of going from that big city mentality to I'm comfortable driving a half hour to go back and forth to a commute to work every day. Well, there is that. A lot of uh, pe newer people that I've talked to, um, one stopped me at the post office here a couple months ago and, and said that the best thing they ever did was move to out of Calgary and into, into our town. They love the town. But I think one of the main things, as we discussed earlier, is cost. Yeah. People just don't have the, the money to spend seven or eight hundred thousand dollars to buy a home when they can come to Iraqana and buy one for four hundred thousand. That's a and steal in today's the, economy. <laughs> yeah. It, it it unfortunately cost seems to be driving everything. That it's driving what you go buy at the grocery store. It it's it's driving a whole lot. So I want to flip the script a little bit here because I hate only talking about challenges because I don't want to assume that only challenges are happening with the municipality. So I want to ask a flip question, and that is, what's the thing you're proud of when it comes to Iricana? What is the thing that you look back on and you say, you know what, we do have our challenges, whether it be infrastructure, whether it be retention, whether it be the cost of living because it's going up across the country. We were doing this right. We we got this thing going for us. What's that for your community? It, being a small community, a lot of people know a lot of people within the community. And uh, everybody sort of helps everybody. It, it's... I was... I grew up on a farm in, in eastern Ontario... And it, it kind of reminds me back to the 50s when I was a kid that uh, our neighbors all helped each other. If, if you saw somebody in trouble, you'd go and help them. 
Um, that's kind of the way it is here. It, it's with the odd few people that are a little different, shall I say? Uh, it, it's, I guess it's the, the old fashioned, I hate to use that term, <laughs> but it's, it's uh, the friendliness of the community, the size of the community. So I, I wouldn't be doing uh, my job. I have to sort of inter interrupt you for a second because I wouldn't be doing my job without asking this question. You said Eastern Ontario. I'm from Eastern Ontario originally as well. Where in Eastern Ontario are you originally from, kind sir? Okay. I was born in Ottawa. I lived with my grandparents on a farm uh, near Lancaster. Do you know yep. Lancaster? Corporate yes, I certainly, yes I certainly do. Too. We were on the second concession of Schlottenburg. Um, and then uh, I ended up living in Belleville, Trenton area. I went to Loyalist. That's where Loyalist I College took my alumni trade school. right here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, it was trade school for me. And when I went, it was nothing but a Quonset hut. It was the very beginning of Loyalist. <laughs> so that's uh, telling you how old I am. <laughs> I know the president of Loyalist College. Uh, the for, I might be the former president now. And if she's listening to this, she is laughing because she has said the exact same thing to me as well. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's a lot of a lot of memories. <laughs> Certainly right. Um, going yeah. back to going back to the accomplishments. Um, so I've been to your community a few times because. I like to visit communities and I'm going to be coming back up there in a few weeks time to visit your community once oh, again. Look me up. I certainly will. I that oh, hopefully we can go grab a coffee. But sure. I get I get a sense that the community is tight knit. The community is very well connected and you know each other because even when I was an outsider coming to your visit community and just walking down Main Street, people waved. People like yeah. said hi to me and they didn't know who they I was. I was like, what is this? I'm coming from a larger community back in Ontario, from Calgary now. It, there's a sense that you're literally, and I use community in the sense like close knit, but you are truly a community where everyone looks out for each other. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. And that, that to me is uh, when we moved here in 2007, uh, I wanted to live in the country. My wife wanted to live in a community with lots of neighbors. This is where we came to, and I haven't minded it, obviously. But uh, it, it, it's, yeah, it's home. So I have to ask about my favorite subject because I said I'm coming to your community and I want to tour your community and hopefully you'll be able to give me a dime tour while I'm there. But what are, the things, what are the things that people can do in Iracana that passes time? Because I'm assuming there's not just uh, events, but what are the major events that you are so proud that your community hosts year after year or this coming summer? What can people do or what can people stop in and see while they're passing through Alberta? Well, uh, if you camp, we have a lovely campground. It's run by our Ag Society. Um, and... In the campground, there is beautiful rodeo grounds, the rodeo arena. And the Egg Society has junior rodeo in September. They have various gymkhanas and whatnot, which is youngsters on their horses showing their 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 skills. It's 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 great to watch the kids. And again, it's more of an agricultural community if that makes sense, even though it's a town. Um, we have a, a brand new walking trail that goes from uh, Iracana to Bicycler. It's about nine kilometers long. And at the other end in Bicycler, they have a few things that would be. Uh, can, I ask a, can I ask a tourist question here? Because every time I come through your community, there's one the spot that I always wanted to know how it came about. And I'm 90% sure it's called the Lions Park. It's almost right downtown. And it's a big, giant playground. And I would say it's probably one of the most picture-perfect playgrounds I have ever seen. Because it's 
it backs onto this luscious green open space, which I'm assuming is a farm, but I could be wrong. But how did this come about? Because I've wanted to know since I've always seen it. Well, thank you for the compliment. It was actually the Lions Club in town built that for us. They're, uh, they're very active. They maintain it. They cut the grass. They, they water it. Uh, it, it. Our Lions Club here is, is a unique uh, organization. Uh, they're very, very supportive of, of the town. And, and uh, your comment uh, shows that. But it is a beautiful park. Uh, that's another thing Iracana has. We have, oh, I don't know how many parks. There's parks all over the town. Uh, kids and adults can go to a park with no more than about a five or a ten minute walk, which is well, great. It, it certainly is. Uh, but at night, after a long day of council meetings, is there a place that you go in the community to decompress, to let it all go, to relax and just recenter yourself? Or, or can we find you at home after a long council meeting and just wanting to just decompress that way? I'm at home. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm at home. Um, there, There is a, I guess there's not a whole lot of nightlife here. There's a, a bar and restaurant down on Second Avenue, down across from the council chambers. There's, uh, that's about it. There's the curling club where in the winter there's that. Uh, but for me, I just, I just come home and call her, call her a night, think about how the meeting went and what was said and what's the next step to move forward. So I want to end on this million dollar question. I think it's a question that every municipal leader knows how to answer. So I, I'm assuming you've answered this numerous times in your head, but let's put it on the record here, right here, right now. In your opinion, what makes Ericana such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I guess maybe the, the town values that we're, we're a small town, we're trying to grow, uh, but we want to grow in a guarded manner, if you will, so that we keep our our small town feel, uh, um, uh, a friendly neighborhood, a safe neighborhood. Um, it, it's it's um, it, it's just to me a great place to live. Well, like I said, I'm looking forward to coming back out there, hopefully in a week's time. we uh, I think it's next weekend that I'm actually heading up that way. So if you got time for a coffee and a quick tour, I'd love to meet you in person, shake your hand. But I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Jim, for so much for sitting down and doing this. This has been such a pleasure and an honor to sit down and talk to A, a former Loyalist College alumni, <laughs> and, and B, the mayor of a community. So thank you so much. Well, well, thank you. It has been a, a pleasant discussion. It really has. I've enjoyed it. And you come to town, um, look me up. We'll definitely have a coffee and go for a, a tour around in the truck. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from the issues on municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations here on the cross-border interviews, or our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to comprehensive source for all things municipal from across Canada. And we can't do the show without you. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, helps amplify the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website, or scroll in the show notes and click on the Support Now link today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, and as always, just keep talking.